I have most of the test threes in and many of them graded and sent back. So you should be getting those back soon if you haven't completed. If you don't have them completed, um, please get those finished up in the next few days and we'll get those in the book for you so we can move on. Um, as expected, the grades were slightly lower on test three, so please make sure you do corrections. Um, remember for corrections, redo the problems you got wrong, show your work, and then send them back. Um, feel free to work with other students, um, other teachers, or if you need to, let me know, and I can try to save some time at the end of a session and help you out or um, figure some way to help you out with those. The big, the big key is I want to make sure, especially for this unit three test with the dosage calculations, I want to make sure you have seen the proper way of doing each problem that you have the formula down um, so that you can use it again later if you needed to. Okay, so we're continuing on now with unit four. Um, unit four, remember, is about geometry <coughs> and graphing. And we've been talking about linear equations. And when we graph the linear equation, like y equals 3 fourth x minus 2, there were shortcuts that helped us graph that really quickly just by looking at this equation. This equation being in this form is what we often refer to as graphing form or that slope-intercept form of an equation. And there's two pieces of information that we can get from that. One is the number that is being added or subtracted from the x. Here, minus 2. 2 is being subtracted. Or you can think of it as a negative 2 is being added. So what that means is on our graph, this line starts out two spaces down from the origin. Remember, this is the origin, the center of our graph. That negative 2 means we go down two spaces from there, and that's where we start this line. The second piece of information we get from the equation is the number that multiplies the variable, in this case x, 3 fourths. And recall that's a slope, and that slope is a rise over run. <clears throat> so 3 fourths means from this point that we started at here, we rise 3, 1, 2, 3, and we run 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, to get to a second point that's on that line. Then we can draw our line through those points. <clears throat> and if we were comfortable drawing it through those points, we could have done a rise of three, run of four again to get another point, and kept going if we needed to. So the y-intercept, let's talk about what that means a little bit. That y-intercept is where we saw here where the line crosses the x-axis, or the y-axis. That's why it's called the y-intercept. But it's also where the other variable, in this case the x variable, equals zero. On that axis, x has a value of zero. And in a real-life application, it would be an initial point, or a starting point. I remember we looked at the example of walking uh, through the city. If you start out six blocks from home and you walk at a rate of two blocks per minute, well, you're six blocks from home, that is your y-intercept. That's your starting point. And then slope, as we said, was a rise over run. But more importantly, it was a rate of change. If you were driving in a car, the speed of your car would be the slope of the line. That is how your, the rate at which your position is changing. Our example, we looked at an IV bag. So the IV bag, um, the flow rate would be the slope. If our flow rate is 5 milliliters per minute, that means the volume of fluid in that bag is changing at a rate of 5 milliliters per minute. 
Now it's getting smaller, so that would be a negative slope. So today we want to look at finding those features, that slope and intercept of a line, and either writing a line or um, doing some problem solving from those features. We're going to focus first on finding slopes. So let's start out with a line on a graph here. And let's just pick a, put a couple points on there and give them a name. Let's say that this point here is the point 2, 4. And this point here is the point 7, 6. I want to find the slope between those. When we were graphing, remember, we went from that, that y-intercept, that starting point, we went rise and run to get to the next point. But we can do the same thing here. We can draw in the rise and the run. If we're moving left to right, the 2, 4 is the first point we get, we would rise from there. And we would rise until we were level with the other point. And then we would run over until we hit that point. Now, first of all, it should be noted that this makes a right angle here because vertical and horizontal always make a right angle with each other. But then if this were on a grid paper or a graph, we could just count, you know, how many spaces we rose and how many spaces we run. But we don't have that here. So how would we find how, how far we went up? Well, if I'm looking at the, the coordinates, ordered pairs like this, if I want to know which one is the change in, in the vertical, a rise, well, that would be the y coordinate. So y here went from 4 to 6. Well, 6 minus 4 is a change of 2. This is a rise of 2 units. If I'm looking at, them, at those coordinates and I want to know the run or the change in the horizontal, that would be the x coordinate. So we went from 2 to 7 here. So 7 minus 2 is 5. We have a run here of 5 units. And of course, slope is rise over run. So this is a 2 over 5, or a 2 fifths slope. So as we analyze that, I mean, we could do this, find slopes off the graph all the time, and we'll do more examples before we're done today. But if we analyze what we did with these coordinates here, we can come up with a formula for calculating slope. So this 2 came from the change in the y variable. Now this symbol here, I shall drop down here, is the Greek letter delta, and it means change in. So delta y is the change in y. We went from 4 to 6. That's the change. Delta x is the change in x. We went from 7 to 2, or from 2 to 7. That's our change in x. So to find the slope of a line, which is, of course, rise over run again. The rise is the change in the y variable, and the run is the change in the x variable. Now, to better define delta y and delta x, um, we're going to put it like this. The change in y is the second y variable minus the first y variable, y2 minus y1. We'll look at where do we get y2 and y1 from a little closer here in just a minute. Of course, the change in x is going to be x2 minus x1. The second x variable minus the first x variable. <clears throat> so back to this set of points here. 2, 4, and 7, 6. If I want to find the slope from those two points, first thing I should do is label one of them as point 1 and the other one as point 2. So I'm going to call this one point 1 and the second one your point 2. Makes sense, right? So now, y2 is 0.2, the y-coordinate. That would be the 6. Minus y1 is 0.1, the y-coordinate. That would be the 4. I subtract those, I get 2. x2 is 0.2, the x-coordinate would be 7. Minus x1, 0.1, the x-coordinate would be 2. 7 minus 2 would be 5. 
So a slope of two fifths, just as we found up above. So the question becomes, how did I know that I should make the first one point one and the second one point two? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter. If I did it the other way around, making this point two and this point one, well, y2 would have been 4 minus y1 of 6. That makes negative 2. x2 of 2 minus x1 of 7 would be a negative 5. Well, negative divided by negative is a positive. That's still a slope of 2 over 5. Rise of 2 run of 5. So we get the same slope. We just have to deal with two negatives canceling each other out to be positive. So if I have a set of points like 3, 8, and 5, 4, I want to find that slope. M is the abbreviation we use for slope. M equals, I'll call this point 1 and point 2 again. Y2 is 4 minus Y1 of 8. It's going to subtract give us negative 4. X2 is 5 minus X1 is 3. That's going to give us 2. Well, negative 4 over 2 is a negative 2. So it's a negative 2 slope. Or if you prefer, you can call it a negative 2 over 1 if you like having it in that rise over run of 4. I'm going to have to try one in your notes. Find the slope of the line through 5, 1, and 3, 4. Give about 30 seconds and then we'll go over that. So, again, I'll just call them points 1 and 2. My slope will be y2 of 4 minus y1 of 1. So that's 4 minus 1 is 3. x2 of 3 minus x1 of 5. 3 minus 5 is a negative 2. So that's negative 3 over, or 3 over negative 2 or negative 3 over 2 is the way we would write. So we would go down 3 and over 2 for that slope. So I started writing here while you were working. Next thing I want to look at is, well, how, what would this do in a practical application? Now, this is going to be a little oversimplified just to make it easier for us at this point. But it is a, a reasonable application of where you would use this. So we're looking at a patient's chart, and the chart says that the IV was started at 1 p.m. So it is currently 3 p.m., and we look in and we check the bag, and the volume in the bag is 900 milliliters of fluid left in that bag. We check back in at 5 p.m. And at 5 p.m., the volume of fluid in that bag is now down to 300 milliliters. So I want to find the flow rate. The rate of change of fluid in that bag just from that information. Well, what we can do is we can actually make ordered pairs or coordinates from that information. At 3 o'clock, we'll just set that at 3 hours. Um, the volume was 9 milliliters. The other way we could have referenced that rather than just absolutely using the 3 p.m. is we could have used 1 p.m. as our zero point and said it was 2 hours from the starting point. We're going to come up with the same slope. We'll come back and do it that way in a second. I'll show you what I mean. The second one, the check in at 5 p.m. Well, at 5 p.m., the volume was 300. If I make this point 1 and point 2, the slope is y2 of 300 minus y1 of 900. It's a negative 600. Over x2 of 5 minus x1 of 3, that's 2. 
So this is a negative 300 slope. Now that is actually, the 300 is in milliliters. The two on bottom was actually in hours. So it's a negative 300 milliliters per hour that that bag is flowing. What that's saying is it's getting smaller. It's, getting, it's emptying at that rate. So the negative means it's flowing out of the bag. If we were looking at medicine flowing into the patient, well, that'd be positive because there's, as time goes on, there's more medicine going into the patient. Now, I had mentioned we could have done this rather than an absolute time is more of a relative time. Treating the, the 1 p.m. as a starting point, 3 hours, 3 p.m. would have been two hours later. So two hours after starting, it was at 900 milliliters. 5 p.m. would have been four hours after 1 p.m. So it went four hours after starting, we were at 300 milliliters. If we did that slope, 0.1 and 0.2, it's still 300 minus 900 for the rise, or negative 600. And on bottom, even though it's different numbers, it's four minus two, which is still a difference of two hours. That still gives us a flow rate of negative 300 milliliters per hour. So without grid paper on the screen, this gets to be a little tricky, but I'm gonna go ahead and do my best here to Create a create a graph. Okay, so we're gonna put some lines here. Just so that we can read the points um, on the axes of the graph. Okay, so I have that line there, and since I don't have grid lines on my, my page here, I drew in some, some kind of projection lines so we can see where the points are. So as we're looking at this, first thing I want to talk about here is what is the y-intercept? So remember, the y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis or where the x value is zero. Well, this is the x value of zero. Trace it up there. Now that's at the second marking, but we have to be careful. We have to look at our scales. This being 10 here, there's only one, two, three, four, five spaces there. So that's telling us that each space is worth two. So this is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So whenever we're looking at a chart or a visual representation like this, we have to be very careful of scales. So that is at four there. So the y-intercept is at y equals four. When x is zero, y is four. Next, we wanna look at that slope, that rate of change. And so normally on a graph, if the scales were equal, I could find two points and I could do my rise and my run. But the scales aren't equal, so I gotta be very careful even though this looks like it's only going up two spots, it's actually going up four because each marking is two for this graph. So it's probably gonna be simpler to just find coordinate points. Now I can actually find, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Line back in there. Um, <clears throat> I can find this one right here, which is actually gonna be zero, four. My y-intercept is always a coordinate point. And I can find this one here, which looks like it's at three comma eight, if I'm using my scales. This one here looks like it's at six comma 12. And I can keep going. This one here will be at nine, 16. I can pick any two of those to find the slope. So let's just use 
the two smallest numbers here. I'll call this point one and point two. So my slope M is Y2, which is eight minus Y1 of four. That's a difference of four. X2, which is three minus X1 of zero. That's a difference of three. So it's a four thirds slope. So then the equation you get here, remember it's that form y equals slope times x plus the y-intercept. We typically use y equals mx plus b, where m represents the slope, and b represents that y-intercept. And then we just plug those numbers into the equation. y equals 4 thirds x plus 4 is our y-intercept. So from here, there's a lot of things we could use this equation. Four. We might try to predict the value of y when x is 15. Well, that's pretty simple. All I'm doing is taking this regression equation that I got, and I'm going to replace x with 15. The so y equals 4 thirds x becomes y equals 4 thirds times 15, and then plus 4. So 4 thirds times 15. Um, 15 divided by 3 is 5 times 4 is 20, or 15 times 4 is 60 divided by 3 is 20. Either way, so y equals 20 plus 4. And then I add the 20 plus 4. y equals 24. So when x is 15, y is going to be 24. I could ask you to predict the value of x when y equals 16. So now we're going to use the same equation, but now we're putting in a value for y instead of x. We know that y equals 16. So 16 goes in for y equals thirds x plus 4, and we're going to solve this like we have several other equations in the past. Let's subtract 4, 12 equals 4 thirds x, then we have to divide by 4 thirds. 12 divided by 4 thirds is 9. x equals 9 when y is 16. So once we get the equation, we can then predict the value for other values in between the points that we had on that, on the given data. So let's look now at writing linear equations. Without having the full graph in front of us like that. You'll notice that from this graph, the only two pieces of information we pulled from that graph were the y-intercept and the slope. And the equation, of course, was just y equals slope times x plus the y-intercept. <clears throat> so I give you an example where I tell you that we have a line with slope equal to one-third and y-intercept equal to 5. Well, it's pretty straightforward. y equals mx plus b. Well, m is 1 third, that's our slope, so y equals 1 third times x, plus the y-intercept is 5, so plus 5. We just fill the numbers into the equation, so there's really nothing for us to do there. A little more interesting is if we know we have a line with slope of 3 halves, and it goes through a point 4, 1. So rather than giving the y-intercept, we give a point that the line goes through. Well, we still start out here, the y equals mx plus b. We'll still start out by putting in the, two, the 3 over 2 for 
m, the slope. y equals 3 over 2 times x. But we don't know what the y-intercept is yet, so we're going to leave that there as the variable b. To find it, we use our point that the line goes through, 4, 1. We know that somewhere on that line, that point, 4, 1, occurs, which means when y, when y is 1 and x is 4, this equation is true. So I'm going to put 1 in for y equals 3 halves. I'm going to put 4 in for x and then solve for b. So now 3 halves times 4 is 6. And now to solve for b, I have to subtract 6 to get negative 5 equals b. So my y-intercept is at negative 5. So that means I go back up here to this equation. y equals 3 halves x plus b. But now that I know that b is a negative 5, I replace the, the plus b with minus 5. So the equation is y equals 3 halves x minus 5. In your notes, I'm going to have you try one quick. And we have a slope. So a line with a slope of negative 1 half. It goes through the point negative 6, negative 1. I'll give you about 30 seconds and then we'll go over that. So the equation is going to take the form y equals mx plus b. We know that the slope is negative one half, so you fill that in. y equals negative one half times x plus b. Then we'll use our equation here. y is negative one. Negative one equals negative one half times when x is negative six. We put negative six in for x plus b. Now we'll do a little bit of calculating here. We know that negative one half times negative six is a positive three. So negative one equals three plus b. And to solve for b, we have to subtract three from both sides. So negative four equals b. So y equals negative one half x plus b. We can replace b with negative four. So y equals negative one half x minus four. We might be given that we have a line that goes through two points. So it might be through 2, 5 and 6, negative 4. Well, this is really the same as what we were just given. Because any time we have two points, we have a slope. The slope m equals I call this point 1 and point 2. y2 two is negative 4 minus y1 is 5. So negative 4 minus 5 is a negative 9. Over x2 is 6 minus x1, which is 2. 6 minus 2 is 4. So I have a slope of negative 4 ninths. So we now know that our equation starts out as y equals a negative 9 fourths, I should say. Negative 9 fourths x plus whatever b is. Now to find b, I have to use one of those points that were given. Doesn't matter which one. If I use the 2, 5, 
So y is 5. 9 fourths times x when x is 2 plus b. All we would do, negative 9 fourths times 2 is negative 9 and a half, 9 over 2, or negative 4 and a half, plus b. Of course, 5 equals that. And we would add 9 halves to both sides. Or 9 halves would be 4 and a half. Well, not 5 plus 9 halves would be four, um, 9 and 1 half equals b. So that would give us, replacing b here with 9 and a half, y equals, oops, here. Replacing b here with 9 and a half gives us y equals negative 9 fourths x plus 9 and a half. <clears throat> If I use the other point, the 6, negative 4, well, negative 4 would go in for y. Negative 9 fourths times 6 plus b. Well, negative 9 fourths times 6 is, oh, what's that? 4, 27, 13, and the negative 13 and a half. The negative 4 equals negative 13 and a half plus b. And we would add 13 and a half to both sides. Well, negative 4 plus 13 and a half is 9 and a half equals b. So we get the same value of b no matter which point we use. So again, let's look at an application. Um, <clears throat> After three hours, an IV bag contains 1,400 milliliters of fluid. At seven hours, it contains 200 milliliters. So again, I want to find the equation. So we're going to start off by finding our slope. I'm going to define two points here. So this first point is at 3, 1400. The second point here is at 7, 200. So my slope, if I call this point 1 and point 2, y2 of 200 minus y1 of 1400 is negative 1200 milliliters. For x, x2 is 7 minus x1 of 3, that's 4 hours. So if I want to reduce that, 1200 negative 1200 divided by 4 is a negative 300, that's milliliters per hour. So that's our flow rate, negative 300 milliliters per hour. So y equals negative 300x plus b. Now I can find b by putting in either one of these points. Let's put in the first one. So x is 3 and y is 1400. So 1400 equals negative 300 times 3 plus b. So negative 300 times 3 is negative 900. So 1400 equals negative 900 plus b. And to get b by itself, we add the 900. So b is 2300. That tells us this, this bay started out with 2300 milliliters of fluid in it. So we come up here and combine that with this. We're going to replace b there. y equals negative 300x plus 2300. Now, it might make more sense kind of thinking about it if you were to put it as y equals 2300 minus 300x because the bag started out at 2300 milliliters and it is remo being, removing 300 milliliters every hour. Um, but this is our typical form. So another example. So a chart. 
It says that the bang was IV started at 10 a.m. We checked at 2 p.m. and the bag had 1,900 milliliters of fluid. We checked again at 4 p.m. and the bag now has 1,600 milliliters of fluid. So let's find that equation. So once again, we need to create some sort of coordinate for each of those. I'm gonna use 10 a.m. as my starting point. So 2 p.m. was four hours later. There was 1,900 milliliters in that bag. 4 p.m. is six hours after 10 p.m. It's now at 1,600 milliliters. Call that point one and point two again. And I find my slope. So at y2 is 1600 minus y1 of 1900. This is negative 300. x2 of 6 minus x1 of 4 gives us 2 hours. So three, negative 300 divided by 2 is negative 150. And that is milliliters per hour is the units on that. So we have that equation so far started of y equals negative 150x. We need to know the y-intercept. So I pick either point. I'll grab that first one up there, 4 and 1900. So y is 1900 when x is 4. So Well, negative 150 times 4 is a negative 600. Then we add 600 to get B by itself. 2,500 equals B. So this full equation is Y equals negative 150 X plus 2,500. So from that equation, let's answer some questions here. One is, how large was the bag when it was full? In other words, how much was in the bag when it started? Well, remember the y-intercept is that starting point or initial point. That's 2,500 milliliters. Next, I want to know what time will the bag be empty? In other words, what time will the volume be zero? So y equals negative 150x plus 2,500. We're going to put zero in for y and figure out what x is. Now, x here, remember, represents the number of hours after the start, after 10 a.m. So when we get x, we're going to have to do some translation, some calculation to figure out what it really means on the clock for us. So here we'll subtract 2,500 from both sides. Negative 2,500 equals negative 150x. And we can divide by one, negative 150. So negative 2,500 divided by negative 150 gives us 16 and two-thirds is x. Now that is in hours. Now first thing we should notice that two-thirds of an hour is two-thirds times 60 or 40 minutes. So 16 hours and 40 minutes is the time that it takes from the start before that bag is empty. Let's start finding the 16 hours here. Where does that put us? We're going to do a timeline here. 
This starts at 10 a.m. Well, noon would be two hours. You still have 14 hours left. Well, 12 hours would take us to midnight. That's a total here of 14 hours. We still need two more hours. That would be 2 a.m. and the 40 minutes. So we end here at 2.40 a.m. would be when that bag would be empty. So that's when we should go in and check a little bit before that, probably around 2.30 to see how the bag is doing. Check the chart, make sure whether do we just remove the IV or do we have to replace it to keep it flowing. So now next time, we're going to talk about parallel and perpendicular lines and dealing with equations and slopes of those. For now, we'll give you your homework. Your homework is on page 226, 1 through 15, the odd. And also, page, pages 231 through 235, 1 through 9. This is just reading different types of graphs. So getting familiar with different types of graphs. So with that, um, we'll let you guys out of here. You guys have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you all on Wednesday.